boys or three o'clock crowd <laughs> welcome back to feet no ryu no skin naruhodo ace attorney the great one um it's a little quiet hopefully you can hear the game hopefully you can hear my woman uh there's not a lot of sounds to work with right now but as promised i'm streaming early today to, let, let's be totally fair. If yesterday's stream went smooth, I probably would have just skipped today. Because I do have to drive into Canada in just like a couple of hours. But because we didn't get to stream yesterday because of internet connectivity issues, I figured all the more reason that I should really, really try to make an effort to stream while it is daytime outside. <laughs> so we're doing a 3 p.m. stream. Uh, a little quick and dirty. We'll see what testimony we can get through and what we can get done. Um, and then I will roll out for the weekend. And it'll be a good time. And everybody will have uh, nothing but great things to say. Okay, so uh, let's just get started before the, everything falls apart on me, right? All right, Gina, what do you got to say? I, we're, we're talking, um, for, in case you missed it, basically what had happened was we finally got Gina to spill the tea and tell us what happened, what went down at the pawn brokery. Um, she was pointing the gun at the man, but they, they, they moved past it. She gave the gun back to him. They went into the back room. Then the other burglars come and he's like, you better stay in this room. Uh, dude gets shot. He falls down. Gina locks the door. She picks up the gun. That's pretty much, um, that's pretty much it actually. So now we just have to prove that to the courts. How am I going to do it? I don't really know, but Mr. Eggard Benedict is going to, hopefully slip up in his testimony. Still, don't forget that I made you a promise. I told you that I'd be on your side till the bitter end, no matter what. But what if I'm lying? Oh my god, girl, stop saying shit like this. Ugh, this is why I cannot fucking stand her. Can you just be like, oh my god, I love that you believe in me. All right, let's go do it, okay? Like, for fuck's sake, the learned helplessness of this girl. I am your lawyer, not your therapist. I don't get paid for this kind of trauma that you have, all right? And I, I, I get it. I should be a little bit more sympathetic. But you know what? I have my own trauma. I don't have time to worry about your trauma. So just, like, stop being annoying. Christ. You could be working to get another killer off the hook for all you know. Well, if I did, you know, as long as I still get paid, quite frankly, I don't care anymore. <laughs> also, I was once in your position, Gina. I was the accused in a trial. What? You were? Yeah, before I left for Japan, I was accused of murder. And strange as it might sound, the circumstances of the crime were pretty damning, to be honest. I was sure that no one was going to believe that it wasn't me who had done it. But, uh, all I needed was a little bit of, uh, friendship. Oh, Runo! There was one person who stood up for me, who believed in me. And she's not here anymore, and I'm actually a little bit kind of pissed off that the game... Like, did the game really just yeet Susado-san away from me? I'm waiting for her big reveal, her big comeback, because I'm like... She was my best fucking friend. <laughs> we... She's the one who was stood by my side in that case. We became besties. We didn't start off on the best terms, don't get me wrong. But we grew to be unlikely compa compatriots. Um... And she was helping me in all of the courts. And now this little fucking 10-year-old girl comes along and all of a sudden Susato-san's like, Bitch, I gotta peace out because my dad is dying. And I'm like, okay, but like, for real? You're just gonna leave during the final court case of the game? It just doesn't sit right with me. Like, she's gotta... S -s -s she's gotta come back. My best friend. Oh my god. We are besties. Oh! Wait. He's talking about Kazuma? Okay, wait a second. <gasps> okay. We're going all the way back to the first trial. Okay, I'm thinking of Kazuma's death, where Susado-san became my new best friend because I was... <laughs> Here's the thing, when you've been implicated for murder multiple times, they start to blend together. You start to forget which ones you're thinking about. I forgot that I have been accused of murder twice already at this point in time. So yes, in the tutorial case of this game, um, I was accused of killing 
some professor guy, and Kazuma, who is my boyfriend, of course he's gonna believe in me because, you know, we're lovers. So, yes, this is also true. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. God rest his soul, you know? Um, Ryunosuke, no one believes you more than I do. Leave this to me. All you need to do is put your faith in me and I'll do the rest. I put everything in you, Kazuma. You are my love. You are my light. You are my reason for existing. And since you're not here, that's rather unfortunate. <laughs> I was so happy that I couldn't help but cry. Even then, somewhere inside me, I couldn't help thinking. Surely he doesn't really believe in me. No, that's bullshit. This is my boyfriend. He believes in me to the bitter end. Anyways, I was wrong. God, this game could have been so good if they just let us be gay lovers the whole time. Like, keep him alive, let him be my- let us put the criminals away together, we will be like gay superheroes in the court of law. It is what was meant to be. You gave me a taste of it, and then you ripped it away from me. And quite frankly, that's not cool. Ugh, Kazuma. He had an absolute and unwavering belief in me. And we looked- we were honestly such a cute couple. We looked amazing together. In turn, I developed an absolute unwavering belief in him. Since then, I came to realize, if you want someone to believe in you, you have to believe in the other person first. What are you saying? I'm saying I'm gonna need you to shut the fuck up. And I promise you, Gina, that no matter what happens, I'm gonna keep believing in you. So just stop this nonsense of saying that I don't. You needn't worry. I'm not gonna let you down. Unless I lose the case. Even though I'm a driver, a diver, a pickpocket, a no good liar. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much a piece of shit person. But I already know this about you, right? So there's no surprises. Also, you're not like McGilded. I know that. You are poor in evil, he is rich in evil, which means he has the capacity to do so much more evil in the world. I don't mean to like shit on you while you're down, but with your poverty stricken ass, there's really not that much you have the ability to do. <laughs> rich people can ruin the whole fucking world. You at best can ruin like maybe two or three people's lives. Huh? <laughs> That's right! You're our poor friend, Ginny! Iris! We know you better than you think. And we've come to the conclusion that you're somebody that we can trust. Uh huh! And that's really all that we need to know. Exactly! Um, Mr. Nara Otto! I, um, I. I'm sniffling! Sniffle! Defendant Gina Lestrade and her legal representative! Court proceedings are about to resume. Please head to the courtroom immediately. Yeah, of course. Thank God. Let's end this conversation. Jacob Welsh, hello. Thank you for the sound. It's good. Changeling DJ, good to see you. John Brown, it's Kazuma! And Karan says, hi. I'd been both a defendant and a defending lawyer in my time. So I knew only too well just how hard it was to put all your faith in another person. And I also knew just how hard it was to bear the burden of another putting all their faith in me. Right. This is it at last. The final chapter. Well, nope, that's a lie because I do know that there are four parts to this trial and we're only starting part three. So <laughs> don't give me false hope like this. Wish me luck, Susato-san. I hope you're watching over me too, partner. Yeah, I got Kazuma up in the stands. I got Susato-san, who needs to show back up at some point. All right, let's go talk to Eggy Boy. Get this show on the road. It's April 17th, 1.41 p.m. at the Old Bailey courtroom number. Oh, we don't do that here. No numbers, just the courtroom. 
I hereby call this court to order as we resume the trial of Miss Gina Lestrade. Lord Von Zeeks, have you successfully subpoenaed the witness? The subpoena was delivered to the communication station where the man works immediately, my lord. However, the heavy rain has delayed the arrival of his carriage, it would seem. Hmm, I see. Well, let us turn our attention to Inspector Gregson's presses on the case heard by the court this morning. The glaring omission of the third bullet in your report is a serious blunder, Inspector. Yes, um, I can only apologize, my lord. And although the defense's chemical analysis of the blood at the scene makes for a compelling argument, I cannot permit such untried methods to be used as evidence in my courtroom. <laughs> you know, it's a big mistake to cross Hurley and me. A very big mistake. My lord, the subpoenaed witness has just arrived in the building. Mm, it's almost like this whole scene was completely unnecessary. Thank you, officer. Show him to the stand. Without delay. Mr. Eggs Benedict. I didn't expect to be crossing paths with him again so soon. And certainly not here in the courtroom. I thought it would happen in the dark room here at the Bull in Berlin. What? Never mind. Nothing. <laughs> oh, hey, there he is. God, those eyes. Thank you for complying with this court subpoena at such short notice, sir. But of course, my lord. As an upstanding member of London society, it's my pleasure to oblige. Now kindly state your name and occupation for the court record. It's Ashley Graydon, communications officer. Mr. Graydon and I both worked in London Central Communication Station. Now perhaps somebody would kindly explain what all of this is about. You were apprised of the situation by the court officer on your way here, I presume. Yes, I was. Something to do with a murder that took place at a pawnbroker's on Baker Street. And some nonsense about me having been there on the night in question. That is the accusation indeed. This really is beyond a joke, you know. Is it? Very well. Without further delay, the court will hear your testimony now, Mr. Graydon. You will respond to the accusation made against you under oath. Gladly, my lord. Gladly. Great. Let's hear it. Witness testimony. Ah, <sighs> start talking, Chwink. Naturally, I have oh, I have occasion to make use of pawnbroking services from time to time. But are you seriously suggesting I colluded with these thugs to break into the place on the night of the murder? I have simply no intention of admitting to such an outrageous accusation, even if certain parties here present claim that their blood was found at the scene of the crime. Some scaramouch detect- what? I'm sorry. It's time to learn a new word today. Scaramouch? Is that how you say- oh wait, I misspelled it. Scaramooch? Scaramouch? Scaramooch. Scaramooch! A boastful but cowardly person. Oh yeah, that does sound like our burglars, doesn't it? Boastful and cowardly. Okay, good to know. We're learning. Some Scaramooch detectives, a homebrewed tink tincture, can hardly be taken as serious evidence. Wow, he's educated. I'm just a Nipponese, what do I know? So you deny the accusation completely, do you? Uh, I must say, I am dismayed. For the highest court in the land to be swayed by this self-professed detective's toy? It was the will of the jury, and our great British justice system demands the jury's will is upheld. Then it would seem we have the misfortune of a most inept assembly of jurors today. Oh, girl, I don't know if you want to piss them off like that. But golly! Now how long am I expected to be detained here? Well, if following the defense's cross-examination, your involvement in this matter has not been established, you'll be free to leave immediately. 
Good. Then I shall be away in time for afternoon tea. Some small consolation at least, I suppose. Well, let us not hold up Mr. Graydon any longer than necessary. Counselor, proceed with the cross-examination. So we meet again. Mr. Eggs Benedict. Or should I say, Ashley. <laughs> Ashley Graydon. And my apologies, who the fuck are you? My name is Ryunosuke Naruhoto, defense lawyer. We've met before. Usually, men remember meeting me. Charmed, I'm sure. If you say so, Ashley Graydon, enchanté. So... Oh. Um, thank you? I trust we can conclude this quickly. Um, well, I just, I, well, I, uh, okay, but I don't, I don't know if I should hold on to your hat. All right, well, you know what we're gonna do. We've got a twink on the stand, so I'm gonna press him for everything. Hold that! Yeah, you know, we actually met in the very pawn brokery where the crime took place on the afternoon of the day in question. Though, of course, you introduced yourself by a different name at the time. Kind of weird, right? <laughs> it was Mr. Eggert Benedict, I believe. Objection. Tell me, is that- Excuse you? What? The witness is here to testify about the events that took place that night. I was getting to that... He is under no obligation to answer such unrelated questions. You can't be serious! Thank you, because I certainly do not feel inclined to answer such an inappropriate question! So he's gonna be evasive, huh? Okay. This might be tricky. Hmm. Just keep trying, boys. Um, that is what I'm suggesting, actually. Have you seen these two men before? This pair? No, I don't associate with criminals. Well, how do you know that they're criminals? Also, how did you know that they were, what was the word? Scaramooch? How, do, if you've never interacted with them, how do you know that they're scare? How do you know that they're boastful and also cowardly at the same time? Also, yeah, you're full of shit. I'd like to know who I have to thank for this. Who made this outlandish accusation against me? The young lawyer there in the black. Well, this is simply a farce. Whose idea was it to permit an outsider to work in a British court anywho? Um, people a little bit less racist? Well, needless to say... No intention of admitting to the accusation. Okay, well... Where were you at around 1 o'clock in the morning on the night in question? That is past the hour at which I would normally retire. Certainly! I was not in the company of these rapscallions! Are you able to prove that? Objection! Yeah, this one kind of makes sense. Listen carefully, my learned Nipponese friend, for you appear to be under a gross misapprehension on this point. Thank you, what do you mean? The witness maintains he was not at the scene of the crime. He has no obligation to prove his absence. Yeah... I mean, he's actually right this time. I do believe the burden of proof is on the accuser. If you're going to accuse somebody of something, you have to prove that they were there at the scene of the crime or whatever. You can't just throw out an accusation on somebody and then make them prove their innocence. At least, not here in Japanifornia. If your accusation is that the witness was present at the scene, the obligation lies with you to prove your assertion. Yeah, well, what about the blood? Let's get into that. Because cause that's coming up. Alright, girl, can you chill the fuck out? Silent victory wiggle. Yeah, keep your wiggling to a minimum. Uh, he, yeah, blood found at the scene. How do we bring this up? Well, uh, blood was found at the scene of the crime. There's no question about that. 
Mr. Sholmes's chemical analysis has positively identified the substance as such. But I'm not the only human to have blood running through my veins, aren't I? How can you be sure that the blood is mine? It could equally be the blood of one of these two miscreants. Well, you see, every individual's blood has a slightly different composition, is what I've been told. Mr. Sholmes's chemical is able to differentiate different types- SPARE ME THE SCIENCE LESSON! But that's my whole job, that's my whole shtick. Who is this Sholmes character anyway? Well, he's a bit of a detective, kinda, sorta. I assumed that all Londoners knew the name. He's a gr well, he's a... He does detective work. So even you are unable to bring yourself to say great detective. A great detective, you say? Tsk! Well, now we're entering the realm of fairy tales, are we? Oh, you don't agree? Excuse me! What's wrong? Do you have something to say about that, Mr. Skulkin? Eh, hey, what? Me? No, the other Mr. Skulkin. Right! You know, I've added up to here with this. How many times do I gotta tell you? Uh, nope. I mean the other Mr. Skulkin. Mr. Nash Skulkin, would you please talk to me? Eh, where? God, blimey, governor! You what? Is it not the case that when Mr. Graydon just spoke, a thought went through your mind? Would you care to share that thought with the class? I mean the court. Art Rod, hello. Eh, me thoughts! I don't have none of those things! It must have been him! Me no think! You what? Look, Mr. Nash Skulkin, just answer the question, please. What went through your mind when Mr. Graydon just spoke? Nothing! Honest, Gov, nothing! I was just thinking. If he waves his arm around like that much more, it'll open the wound again is all! I beg your goddamn pardon, what? You know, where he took the bullet, of course. It was only two days ago. It can't be all healed up yet. So I was, uh, well, you know, just worrying for him and all. You wiggling, writhing thief, you have a bullet in you? Oh, hell's perilous. I'm sorry, Mr. Graydon. Did you just hear that? Are we talking about the same thing? What? Well, your comrade is worried about you, it seems. Worried that you might, you know, hurt yourself. On account of your injured arm. That you're holding. My lord! Yes, Mr. Graydon. I have no idea what these two wretches are talking about. Certainly I shouldn't be expected to answer anything in relation to their mindless insinuations. Hmm. We know that someone other than the victim was hit by a bullet at the scene of the crime two nights ago. And from the height of the bullet hole in the wall, that person was likely hit in the upper arm or thereabouts. Perhaps you'd allow a court official to examine your arm. The left arm that you're currently clasping with your right hand, almost as if you're in... PAIN. No! I refuse. Is he allowed to refuse? You have shown no evidence whatsoever that links me to these common thieves. Accordingly, I am not obliged to permit any such invasion of my privacy. But, like, his arm is clearly injured. As I've said already, I'm completely uninvolved in all of this. I've never had anything to do with the pawn brokery where this fellow was killed or whatsoever. And I take offense at the insinuation that I was in any way involved. Hmm. You claim to have had nothing whatsoever to do with Mr. Windebank's pawnbrokery. My lord. The defense would like that statement to be added to Mr. Graydon's formal testimony, please. Ooh, we're gonna hit him with some evidence, I think. Continue with your testimony, Mr. Graydon. <laughs> he looks mad as hell. Okay, uh, bottom line is I've never had anything to do with the pawnbroking establishment where this man was killed. All right, let me look, uh, which one of these tickets is his? Uh, how do I find that out? Was it this one? I don't know. Mr. Windebank used the redemption ticket, it's written very neatly. Okay, not, not this one, maybe another one? 
Gina's representation, pawnbroker's ticket. Uh, issued from the pawn brokery owned by the victim, Mr. Windebank. The blood on it is thrice fired masons. That's not helpful. The blood samples portfolio, the manuscript, McGilded case notes, today's paper, autopsy report, crime scene photo. Wait a second. Um. The disc? The disc is the thing he wanted to pick up, right? I thought we would have to prove it with a pawnbroker's ticket. But it doesn't seem that that's gonna help us. Right? I guess not. Um... Never had anything to do with the pawn broking. I th I think the disc is what we're good because this is the item that he wanted to pick up. It should certainly at least get a reaction out of him. Also, I do have five health again, so we can probably fuck this up. Have you ever seen <clears throat> this disc before, Ashley? It's Mr. Graydon, and why? Is it supposed to mean something to me? Well, the disc was until the day of his murder in pawn in Mr. Windebank's shop. It was redeemed by the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, that afternoon. However, someone had mysteriously appeared to try to take it from her. John Brown, goodbye. Hope to catch you uh, in the next one. And that somebody was, of course, you, wasn't it, Mr. Graydon, under the alias of Mr. Eggs Benedict? As I've reiterated numerous times now, you are mistaken. That was not me. I have never seen that disc before in my life. It may have escaped your notice, but there's a small smear of blood on the disc. Ah, oh, yes. Resulting from an abrasion of the thumb, perhaps. Exactly. That's right. The surface of the disc is covered in hundreds of tiny metal bumps. In the skirmish to acquire the disc, the thumb of the person who tried to take it suffered minor lacerations. So, while the disc bears the remnants of that skirmish in the form of this smear of blood, the thumb of the person in question must bear the remnants also, in the form of a scratch. Oh, good gracious, indeed it must. Uh, Mr. Ashley, that's Mr. Graydon, you refused to allow a court officer to examine your arm before. Are you now going to refuse to allow us to examine your thumb? Because I have no doubt that it bears a small scratch consistent with the smear of blood on this disc. Ugh. Well, I... It would seem I underestimated you. What is the meaning of this? So you admit it now. You admit that you have a scratch on your thumb from when you attempted to take the disc from the... From when you... <laughs> From when you said, from when you tried to take the disc from the defendant, I rest my case. You've been lawyered. Order, order! Well, Mr. Graydon. It would appear there's been something of a misunderstanding here. I did not attempt to take the disc as you put it. No, quite the reverse. What do you mean? It's really quite simple, you see. The disc was mine, from the outset. Is there some crime in taking an item that you own out of pawn? So then you did have something to do with the pawn brokery. It would seem, Mr. Graydon, that in this piece of evidence, my learned friend has established a link between yourself and the incident. Accordingly, you will tell the court everything you know about the disc now. As you wish. Though I'm quite sure it has nothing whatsoever to do with the pawnbroker's murder. Alright, witness testimony round two. Let's talk about this disc. There's a note on the disc saying for McGilded, but the item belongs to me. The redemption ticket was stolen from me by the accused. That filthy guttering trash. On the day in question. I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police. In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the shop later that same night. Hmm. Yeah, that's a little bit tricky, isn't it? 
Did I hear you correctly, sir? McGill, did you say? The famous London philanthropist? Who perished in this very courtroom two months ago after being acquitted of a distinctly messy murder. Yes, my lord, the one and the same, my sugar daddy. That's neither here nor there. Oh, good lord! Mr. Graydon! Are you saying that Mr. McGilton and yourself were... acquainted? I mean, do you... I mean, I think he was very explicit in that explanation. Yes, that's what a sugar daddy is, my lord. Damn, he was literally Mr. McGilded's bottom. I'm invested in the story now. <laughs> Order! Well, I certainly didn't expect to hear that name uttered here in my courtroom again. According to what Gina told us, this disc was placed in pawn on the fateful night two months ago. McGilded himself gave instructions to deposit it at Windbanks. It's funny that Mr. Graydon here is claiming the disc belongs to him then, isn't it? In all likelihood, he's got to be lying. So he appeared that afternoon at Windbanks in order to get his hands on McGilded's disc for some reason. Counsel, you will commence your cross-examination, please. Right. I'm ready to press it all. Here we go. Uh, talk to me about this. Would you care to explain how this belongs to you? As you will observe, a communications officer such as myself commands a fine salary. You are certainly exquisitely dressed, sir. So you see, I have little need to make use of the services provided by the pawn brokery trade. However, I did once find myself in difficulties having misplaced my purse whilst on an errand. That's why I pawned my fine black overcoat to the broker in question. It's not because your salary sucks and your sugar daddy died? So you're claiming that the overcoat was also yours? <laughs> Obviously. And in my haste, I simply forgot to clean. That the music box disc was in its pocket. And yet there is a note on it that reads, For McGilded. Well, I'm a collector of rare and unusual music box music. I first met McGilded at a, um... We could call it a gentleman's club in the city. Uh, and I was interested to discover that he shared my penchant in that area. Yo, is this game straight up putting these men at a bathhouse together? So the disc in question... It's a pre-production sample. I promised to let McGilded hear it after I met him at Steamworks. Girl? Oh my god! But then you forgot that it was in the pocket of the overcoat you were forced to pawn. Yes, exactly. Hold up, can I hear more about the Steamworks entourage? Gina didn't mention any of that in her testimony two months ago, did she? Well, no. Because McGilda threatened her to keep her mouth shut. That means that if we dig too deeply here, it's going to expose Gina's perjury. Oh. Shit. Well, you know. Sometimes... You have to be found guilty of one crime to be found innocent of another. Oh dear! This is complicated, isn't it? Well, I guess we'll leave it alone for the time being, but honestly, I don't mind throwing Gina under the bus if we have to. Alright, the redemption ticket was stolen. Let's talk about that. So you're saying that Miss Lestrade lifted the ticket from your pocket or bag? That's right! Despite being mindful of danger when walking in insalubri insal insalubrious areas, her kind's frequent. Girl, is that like your fancy way of saying the ghetto? Insalubrious. I, well, I have to learn because, listen, if, I, if I'm gonna get one thing out of this game, it's going to be a better vocabulary. Insalubrious. Um. Insalubrious. Insalubrious. Google's first definition of insalubrious is not salubrious. Oh my god, I need to kill myself. <laughs> the second definition is it means unhealthy, but that just kills me. <laughs> What's the def- what does insalubrious mean? It means not salubrious. What's salubrious mean? 
Salubrious. Health giving or healthy. Salubrious. All right. Pleasant, not run down. Okay, good to know. Nice. <laughs> All right. I be very careful when I'm walking in the insalubrious areas her kind frequent. Miss Lestrade did no such thing! Well, of course you would take that stance, but the girl is simply a regular offender. You came to the pawn brokery that day prepared with all the information you needed to identify the defendant. You were looking for her. That's what brought you to Windbanks. To get your hands on McGilda's Objection. disc. My learned friend is a veritable font of nonsense. Nonsense? I concur with the prosecution. Saroon! Hello, welcome to the stream. Yeah, we're doing an early day stream. I'll try not to make a habit out of it. Counselor, you will refrain from conjecturing in this way, is that clear? Yeah, my lord, sorry. Then I will continue with my testimony for what possible use it can be. Alright, proceeded to the shop to uh, explain my situation. Let's press that. Had you ever been to Windebanks before? Only once for the purposes of pawning something. But like many, I enjoy browsing such establishments. So when you noticed that the pickpocket had taken your ticket, you chased after her, is that correct? Yes, that's right. I didn't notice at first, of course, such is the art of the pick purse. But when I did, I headed to the pawn brokery at once in order to reclaim my coat before the thief could. I was merely trying to recover what was rightfully mine in the first place. Alright, he can sure talk the talk, but can he walk the walk? Uh, the disc was taken by the police. I mean, this is true. Do I really need to press this? It was taken by Inspector Gregson, wasn't it? That's right. That's the very man. Apparently, the police are collecting anything that has connection to Mr. McGilted as evidence. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, do you want to re re rebute that? Rebut that? Is something wrong, Inspector? Um, well, um, what do you mean? The last remark that Ashley's made in this testimony seemed to trouble you in some way. It's Mr. Graydon! Ah, uh, no, no, it didn't. It's nothing, I would just leave it alone. Let me ask you this, Inspector. Why is Scotland Yard gathering Mr. McGilded's possessions? I can't tell you something like that, Sunshine! What is it, Inspector? Investigative secrets? Exactly! You should know all about that! Magnus McGilded, who died so unexpectedly after his trial two months ago. A man renowned throughout the capital for his great contributions to public life, yet he had a dark side too. Where are you going with this, Von Zeeks? I suppose the police are dealing with the aftermath of his nefarious activities, are they? That's enough out of you! Coppers like me have duties to carry out and we're not at liberty to talk about. That's all you need to know. Duties conferred by Lord Strongheart, I presume. The Lord Chief Justice appears to have great faith in you, Inspector. Tea? Hot tea. The bottom line is, if you want to get more out of me, you're gonna need Lord Strongheart's paw print first. I don't know what that means. What's all this about? <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's like there's something going on between Gregson and Lord Von Zeeks here. Maybe they're fucking. Wait, no. I think I just have horny brain. Maybe they're colluding. Or maybe they're enemies? They're at odds about something. Well, it would appear that the inspector has revealed all he is at liberty to reveal. Mr. Graded, let us return to your testimony. Gladly, my lord. All right, no reason to break into the shop later that same night. Are we sure about that? Well, perhaps you'd seen something of value among the forfeited items. Nope, not at all. Oh. A valuer was brought in by the police to assess everything in the shop. 
Without exception, every article on the shelves was common or garden bric-a-brac. What does that mean? In that case, it's clear. It's clear that you broke into the shop later that day in order to recover Mr. McGilded's disc. Have you not been listening, man? Even if I had wanted to recover the disc, why don't you recall that it had been seized by the police that afternoon? It was no more in the shop that night than I, as I keep saying. I simply had no reason to break in. So there was nothing of McGilded's left in the shop that night. Oh, wait a damn minute. Oh, wait a second. These are notes about the McGilded case. The manuscript? That's not really anything of McGilded's. Um... Something else of McGilded's? Windabang's guns, Skulkin Brothers' guns, photos, the stereoscope, the music box, disc, the third bullet... Well, hang on to that. I wonder if that's really true. Oh, Runo! If you have some evidence! Let him have it! I'm dying to see that irritatingly assured expression of his crumble! McGilded slipped the disc into his coat pocket and had it deposited at Windbanks. Then, when he realized he was going to be arrested on suspicion of the omnibus murder, he threatened Gina and forced her to take the redemption ticket. There's no doubt about it! That witness is lying through his pearly white teeth! The police were obviously after anything left behind by McGilded as well. And that's why Inspector Gregson ended up taking the disc into custody that day. But Gregson's being very strange about all of this! Yeah, and there's gotta be a reason for that too, but we can work out that later. For now, I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Graydon is lying in his testimony. Okay. So... Maybe that's what this one is? A redemption ticket, owned by the victim. Blood on it has been identified as Mr. Mason's. Um... Let me look over these again. A victim was found deceased on the last scheduled omnibus of the day after a stab wound to the abdomen. Okay, that's fine. Trial summary. Conviction was assured with three eyewitness testimonies. However, a surprise fourth witness. Okay, insufficient evidence. Um... This morning's paper all about stuff being leaked to foreign agencies. I mean, maybe you read this again, really? Oh, what's on the back again? Sensational story lower down on the front page as well. Ministry Mole classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Okay. I don't think that's... I don't think that's relevant yet. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, what is this? Pawnbroker Parishes for Ginny... Do gooder, something like that. Crowd pickpocket. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Um, something of McGilded's. There's this. When does this come into play? I wonder. This isn't McGilded's though. The Hound of the Baskervilles. I use Daddy's notes to write. This is Iris's. Um... Uh... Look at things three-dimensionally. The disc... something other than the disc. I'm inclined to believe, I think of the evidence we have, the most suspicious thing that we have is that we have this ticket with this guy's blood on it. 
that's like something that you would want to steal, right? Objection. Nope, this was wrong. <laughs> Shit. Whoops. My bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Okay, fuck my oopsies. Oh wait, did I present on the wrong statement? I might have done. Hold up. I had no reason to break into the... Okay, hang on. <laughs> Let me do a save really quick. Did I just present that on the wrong statement or was that the wrong evidence? Shit, I wasn't paying attention. This might be a really bold fuck up. Um, I'm gonna present the same thing again. Objection. Nope, it's still it's still it's still wrong. It's still still very very wrong. My bad. Okay, oopsies. <laughs> okay, okay. My bad. My bad. No reason to break into the shop later that same night. No reason. What about this ticket? Uh, let me re-examine this again. One small box in receipt of the above-mentioned article or articles, 10 shillings. The back of this photograph to write out a redemption ticket. He's written it very neatly. He ran out of paper, so we had to use anything on hand. Maybe it's this one? It is! Okay, I just had the wrong ticket. Damn. Alright, having two tickets makes it very confusing. Fine. Okay. The disc was deposited at Windabanks on Magnus McGilded's instructions. You knew that, and you went there with the intention of obtaining it for Objection. yourself. Conjecture again. And in any case, the disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. The witness had no reason to revisit the pawnbrokery Objection. again that night. I'm sorry, my learned friend, but that's not- Oh shit, throw it back in his face! What? Mr. McGilded had another article in pawn at Windebanks. As this second pawnbroker's ticket proves. <sighs> there were two articles belonging to Mr. McGilded in Windebanks pawn brokery, and the reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulkin Brothers. Ugh. Hmm. This is the second ticket, isn't it? What had the man deposited? The article description reads, One small box. That's a rather vague description, it seems to be. Are you suggesting that I broke into the pawnbrokery with these... clowns in order to steal some trinket box? I believe there are adequate grounds to suspect that you did. This is absurd! Why on earth would I do such a thing? Once the article had been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There would be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. That's a very fair point. Let me think on that for a minute. Hmm, indeed. The witness makes a solid argument. So that means that for some reason... This Graydon fellow needed the small box that very night, does it? Objection. Oh. It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Uh, could you be a little less cryptic, Lord Von Seeks? I do hate to ruin my learned friend's arguments, but the truth is quite incontrovertible. On the night in question, no small box was taken from Windebank's pawn brokery. And rest assured, the prosecution can prove it. I can prove why, though, because the small box is the box that has the Hound of the Baskervilles, which is the box that was in the room that Gina locked, so nobody was able to get inside when Windebank died. It is all clicking together, except why did Mr. McGilded have the Hound of the Baskervilles? Because that was what was in that box. Did he steal the story? Was he given the story by Mr. Sholmes? Did- is this the case? Hang on. Alright, here's a wild speculation. If this is true, Iris should really help me out. What if, 
What if Mr. McGilda's master plot? Here, all, all, the, all the wheels are turning. I'm solving the case now. What if the Hound of the Baskervilles, which we have not been able to read, what if this is the story about committing the perfect murder and then it was executed just like the story? And that's why the story is the ultimate piece of evidence because it was actually the murder plan. This happened in an episode of Veronica Mars. Okay, so... Put a pin in it, spoilers for Veronica Mars, amazing show, if you've never watched it, I highly recommend it, as Kristen Bell, who doesn't love her? She, in college, wrote, like, how to commit a perfect murder or whatever, or something to that effect, and then, uh, the, the, the villain, well, one of the, 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 the villainous people in the story who commits murder, stole the idea from her literal paper and put it into execution. It is a trope in media, this could be what is happening here, I think. But it still doesn't make total sense. Why does he have possession of this? Well, is it because he just lost it from... Or because he bought it from... I mean, what's his name? Mr. Sholmes doesn't keep that goddamn... Keep a lot of track of where his stuff goes. Mm, there, there's some loose threads. But I think... I think I'm figuring it out. Huh? Oh, good gracious. Inspector, show the photographic prints to the court if you please. Ah, uh, yes, sir! What prints? These prints were taken from one of the detective security cameras. Curly's red-handed recorders again! As previously explained, using this plan of the shop layout. The victim's establishment was furnished with automatic cameras in two locations. One was set to capture the counter where Mr. Windebank received his customers, and the other was set to capture the shelves on which the articles were placed for sale once forfeited. According to the information on this ticket, the gilded small box had been forfeited already. Two days before the incident at 9pm on April 13th to be precise. Which means it would have been on the shelves of forfeited items in the shop up front. Well wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Now what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident. That's at 11pm on April 15th. Hmm. Wow, the victim certainly had a full shop, it would appear. Yeah. And then here we have another print. This one was taken about two hours after the incident. I see, so we have two pictures to compare. Though I must say that placing them side by side leaves me cold. Yeah, they all look exactly the same, right? I don't see any differences. Dear me, this, you know, this is starting to make my headache. Obviously, at Scotland Yard, we considered theft as one possible motive for this case. We explored the possibility that something had been taken in addition to the victim's life. So you men have already compared these two prints thoroughly, Inspector. Yes, sir. We counted every single item in each of these two photographic prints. And the Yard's conclusion is that Exactly the same number are present in both. Hmm. In other words, nothing was taken from the pawn brokery on the night in question. And my learned friend's assertion is nothing more than a hopeful fantasy. Uh, well, I... I'm building to something here. If I could have just shown that he'd stolen McGilded's pawned box. Alright, girl... I might have been able to break him down. You know what, Runo? I've been thinking. I wonder if these two photographs really are exactly the same. What do you mean? Is this another thing where I have to look at it in 3D and use my stereoscope? Because that seems to be the running gag in this trial. So, counsel, in the light of evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? It seems, in fact, that on the night in question, nothing was stolen from the victim's establishment. Do you accept the prosecution's assertion? I don't know. Could there be some hidden discrepancy between these two photographic prints somewhere? Can I use the stereoscope viewer, please? Uh, before I give my answer, my lord, I'd really like to try something if I could. What do you mean, counsel? I'll need to use a certain piece of evidence from the court record to identify the discrepancy. I'm not entirely sure I follow. What piece of evidence do you intend- I would like to look at these photos with the stereoscope viewer, please. 
I'd like to use this device, my lord, to view the two prints stereoscopically. Oh! <laughs> Stereoscope! Yes! You've caught the bug at last! You can't resist it, can ya? All right, calm down, boy. You've got the cross-eyed compulsion! Uh, juror number three, what a surprise. Uh, come on, Runo! Let's put the pictures in place and see what this wonderful contraption shows us. Yeah. Okay. There we go! Now look through the eyepiece. Okay. Something about this box is different. I wasn't sure at first, but... There is a clear discrepancy between the two prints. Can I look at them separately again? What? What? You must identify the location in question for the court council. So this is really... I wonder if this is like a gimmick we're missing out on because we're not playing this game in 3D. I wonder... I'm curious. Maybe I should have played this on the 3DS and like downloaded an illegal ROM. <laughs> that's been translated into English. Because this game came out for the 3DS. And it's like, I'm so curious if like, if you played this game authentically, like you looked at these photos and maybe if you turned your 3D slider up, this little box like popped out at you or something instead of like what they're doing here where they're just kind of highlighting it. That would make sense to me. Um, Take that! I'll have to look into it. Granted, these two prints are almost identical. However, there is one minor discrepancy between them. What? Yeah, it was a gimmick for the 3DS. That's what I was thinking. When you view the two pictures stereoscopically... A single area stands out as being different. The location of this small box. Let me... <laughs> he looks so stupid looking through it. No, it's fine. It's fine. Unbelievable. Oh, by Jove, you're right. How extraordinary. What this tells us is very simple. Mr. McGilded's small box was indeed not stolen from Windebanks on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt that somebody picked up this particular box and then returned it to its place on the shelves. Also, yeah, I guess you can do the cross-eyed thing. I'm not very good at looking at images stereoscopically on my own by crossing my eyes. It just, everything, like, gets, my vision gets very fucking blurry and everything... <laughs> I can't do it that way successfully. I need the 3DS to do it for me. <laughs> Um, okay, so somebody did pick up this box, and then they put it back. So then my theory was actually wrong. My whole brain blast I had about the Hound of the Baskervilles coming into play... ...was just me being a fucking idiot. Alright, that is still very much Herlock Sholmes' item. It wasn't McGilded's item. McGilded had this box. So then, the million dollar question now becomes... What was in the box? Damn it, I have to throw away my whole theory! That's so stupid. Are you suggesting that the small box originally deposited by Mr. McGilded is in fact... Yes! The very same small box that I just identified in those photographic Attention. prints. Mindless guesswork. What if it was? Huh? So a box was moved on the shelf. Nothing was stolen. That means quite simply... That nothing has changed. What was in the box, my guy? Are you kidding me? That could be true, but it also could be completely false. If McGilda's box wasn't stolen, doesn't the fact that it was moved change anything? It changes everything! Something could have been taken out of the box. I believe this changes everything about the case. How can that possibly be? The crucial point is the fact that what was moved was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside of the box. Do you... Dora the Explorer logic! Do you understand how boxes work? What are you suggesting? Oh my god! I'm suggesting that there was something inside of the box! For fuck's sake! Is everybody here delusional?
I'm suggesting we take a look at the box. ASAP, please. It's a vital piece of evidence, and it's sitting on the shelves at Windabanks as we speak. That won't be necessary. Some little box belonging to a man who died two months ago can't possibly be relevant to this trial. The court does not hold up your objection, Lord Vonza. Thank God. Thank you, Your Honor. Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to Baker Street at once. Obtain the small box in question and bring it back for further examination. Great. This is good. Right? He looks pissed, but that means that I'm probably doing a good job. He looks pissed, but that also probably means that I'm doing a good job. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. We should have a report within half an hour. I think perhaps we should recess for a short time until the evidence is brought forth. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. Hm, <laughs> disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Von Zeeks. This is nothing but a smokescreen. A Nipponese specialty, it would seem. What exactly are you trying to say? My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning. That this witness's intent was to steal an article belonging to Mr. McGilded from the pawn brokery. Yet common sense tells us that none of the articles have value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly! That's what I keep trying to say. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for the purpose of stealing such commonplace property. Hmm. If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGilded perished two months ago immediately after the conclusion of his trial. A trial in which he was found not guilty. A trial in which it was established he was the upstanding member of society his reputation implied, in fact. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. Thank you? The articles in the upstanding member of society pond were entirely ordinary. A black overcoat that just happened to have a music box disc in one of its pockets, and a small box. Yeah, but you seem pretty hell-bent on getting the music box piece disc. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if the man tried to make a gift of such things to me. But you were so hell-bent on getting it. What? No. Fuck you. You know, that does make a rather lot of sense. It's not as if it was gold or jewels, was it? Though goodness knows Mr. McGilded was rich enough! You can't be depositing cash at a pawn broker, eh? The prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. Johnny Petriello, doing good now that you're here. How's it going? It is incumbent on the defense now to bolster its argument. Okay. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles pawned by this fine citizen could have. Well, counsel, is your argument in fact demonstrable? Are you able to show proof that the disc or the box are in any tangible way related to this case? Well, I thought I could... Oh, what's the matter, Runo? We know that they're related, don't we? They're both vital pieces of evidence. Well, yeah, you and I know that. We know McGilded's true character, and we know that the disc is significant, but we don't know why. If we explain all that to the court at this point, we're gonna have to acknowledge that McGilded's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That the defense's argument was flawed and based on false information. Oh shit! Oh, watch your tongue. So that would mean admitting that Gina had committed perjury. But Ginny! I wonder if Von Zeeks knows. Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated this? But maybe... Maybe this could be a great opportunity for us! I beg your pardon? Well, what is it that you always say, Runo? Sooner or later, the truth comes out every time! Yeah, so let's just let the truth out and deal with the consequences. The exact significance of the things that McGilda deposited with Mr. Windebank is something that only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, 
it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. Who, Nelly? What do I do here? Eh, have Gina testify. Throw her under the bus. Why not? Oh, my lord! The defense would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, counsel? While the court awaits the arrival of Mr. McGilded's small box... <laughs> that's a sentence. I would like to call the defendant Miss Gina Lestrade to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited at Windebanks by Mr. McGilded, my lord. Miss Lestrade has information related to them. And I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It'll prove the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well, things are certainly becoming interesting. I presume you've considered the implications of the testimony you're proposing, in particular the impact it will have on the accused's standing, and indeed your own. I have. Lord Von Zeeks, would you care to explain that last remark? The prosecution accepts the defense's proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Oh. Well, very well, if you have no objections. The court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. Great. And we will do that in the next one. Chat, first and foremost, I hear you guys. Uh, you guys are saying that Gina's testimony is the last one in the third part. However, um, I'm going to counter that with what I have learned is that even one singular testimony and then the cross-examination and then the aftermath of that cross-examination can round up to quite a lengthy amount of time in this type of game. So I don't think it's as simple as, oh, it's only one testimony. It's only going to be like 15 minutes. I think it could easily be 30 minutes to an hour. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong in that, but... I think one more testimony is quite a bit for this specific game where things tend to drag on. So I think it'll be best to save Gina's testimony for our next time when we get ready to play. Uh, so I'm gonna save it here actually because I also don't have the luxury of having all of that time because I do have to get ready to uh, go to Canada. Ugh. Um, yeah, I have plans tonight actually. I have a social life every once in a blue moon. Uh, but anyways, I hope to uh, get some good tea out of Gina in the next one. I hope you guys will join me there. Please leave a like on this stream. Um, engagement is super helpful, all things considered. I apologize about the technical difficulties last night. And um, if any of you guys are watching this thing all the way through in a... Uh, as a VOD later tonight because you guys weren't able to be here for today's stream because it's different hours. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for watching it as a VOD. Let me know. Let me know that you're, you you came and you watched it. Maybe you pretended that it was live anyways. Uh, but this has been me. I'm about to roll out and I will see you guys next time. All right, boys. Toodles. <laughs>